Chapter Seven of Esther Reed Yet Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Esther Reed Yet Speaking by Pansy. Chapter Seven. What a little schemer it is. A riot, not among men, which is sufficiently terrifying, nor yet among women, which is worse, but that most awful of all sights and sounds of sin, a riot among children swearing spitting at one another tearing one another's hair scratching like tigers growling like wild beasts throwing garbage at one another this was the sort of crowd upon which mrs roberts in her black silk walking suit with her velvet hat and seal furs presently came she grasped at dick's arm in horror but a feeling that was more than terror was taking her strength away oh she said and the agony in her voice really suggested more than terror to the young fellow beside her and they are little children they cannot be more than seven or eight. Oh, what can i do you needn't be scared mum there was a little hint of something like pity in dick's voice she clung to him so that he could not help feeling himself her protector it ain't an uncommon row at all they mostly act like this most likely one of em's found a bone and t'other one wants it and then they're gone in for a row and all the young ones crowd around and fight on one side or t'other did this fearful explanation make the situation less terrible there was a lull however in the quarrel the elegantly dressed lady was seen approaching an unusual sight in that alley and both parties paused to get a view paused in their attentions to each other that is but at Mrs. Roberts they hooted and jeered, and one threw a handful of mud. Then did Nimble Dick rise to his position as protector. Shut up there! Stand aside, Pluck, and let us pass. Look out there, you smirchy! Don't you throw that over here unless you want your head broke for you when I get back. This threat was thrown at a wretched little girl, who had dived her hand deeply into a box or cask of garbage, and brought it forth reeking with rotten apples, pork fat, and any liquid horror which the name suggests to you she had her hand uplifted ready to throw and was evidently intending to give the strange lady the benefit of what she had prepared for one of the rioters the assured tone in which nimble dick spoke had its effect the combatants were all small and he was large and was evidently recognized as a power there were some defiant glances thrown at him but the motley crowd gave way and allowed him to pass uninjured Still, he kept an alert watch of them until quite out of reach, and was not sparing of his admonitions. Hold on there, Bill, I see that. Look out, Sally, you'll be sorry if you throw anything, mind you that. And at last they were through the crowd, not out of danger, it seemed, for there, directly in their narrow path, was a drunken man, swaying from side to side in the way which is so terrible to one unused to such sights. Dick felt the hold on his arm tighten, and was astonished at the sound of his own voice as he said soothingly, "'You needn't be scared at him, Mum. That's only old Jock. He's as ugly as old Nick himself, but he knows better than to be very ugly to me. I can throw him in the gutter as easy as I could them young ones, and he knows it. That's Dirk's father, that is. Ain't he a beauty?' And again Mrs. Roberts uttered an exclamation of dismay, and part of her terror went out in sorrow over the wrongs of a boy who had such a home and such a father. What ought to be expected of him? That interminable alley was conquered at last, and they emerged into respectability on the broad avenue. Mrs. Roberts released her hold of her protector's arm, and his new character vanished on the instant. "'You're here, Mum,' he said, with a saucy twinkle in his eye and a saucy leer on his face. Can you get yourself home from the spot, or shall I borrow a wheelbarrow and tote you there? Much shaken with various emotions though she was, Mrs. Roberts forced herself to laugh. She would not frown on his fun when it was not positively sinful. He might not be aware that it was disrespectful. He might never have heard the word. I know the way now, thank you. At least I think I do. Can you tell me whether I take a green car or a yellow one to get to East 55th Street? You take a green one, he said quietly, his character of protector having returned to him with the question, which still showed her dependence on him. Thank you, she said again with great heartiness. I shall never forget your care of me. Her hand was in her pocket, and a bright coin was between her fingers. She longed to give it to Nimble Dick, 
he had saved her from so much this morning. And he was so miserably clad, surely he needed help. A moment's reflection, and she resolutely withdrew her hand. He should be paid by a simple hearty thank you this morning, for kindness rendered. He might not consider it a current coin, but possibly it would be his first lesson in the courtesies of life. Later in the day, when Mrs. Roberts was somewhat rested from her morning's campaign, young Reed received a little note. Dear Mr. Reed, I know the names of all the boys, and enclose you a list. It is possible that you may fall in with someone during the day who can impart knowledge concerning them. Anyway, I thought you would like to know their names. Keep me posted, please, as to your success in making their acquaintance. We are allies, remember. Yours for the Master, Mrs. E. L. Roberts. Alfred Reed twisted the delicate note-paper thoughtfully in his hand, a look of perplexity on his face. He felt committed for labor, glad was he, very, yet perplexed. He did not in the least know where to commence. Well, neither had this little lady, yet she had accomplished more in her one day's acquaintance than he after a lapse of weeks. Either she had found opportunities or had made them. There must be chances. He would be sure to keep his eyes open after this. In the handsome house on East 55th Street, where Mr. Roberts had settled his bride, after a somewhat extended business tour involving months of absence, matters were in train for a cosy evening in the library. That was the name of the beautiful room where the husband and wife sat down together, but it was quite unlike the conventional library. Books there were in lavish abundance, but there were also pictures and flowers and a singing bird or two, and an utter absence of that severe attention to business details which characterizes most rooms so named. Little prettinesses, which Mr. Roberts smilingly admitted did not belong to a library, were yet established there, with an air of having come to stay. We will call it the library for convenience, the master of the house said, and then we will put into it whatever we please. It shall be a conservatory, and a sewing room, and a lounging room, and anything else that you and I choose to make it. And Mrs. Roberts gleefully assented, and gave free rein to her pretty tastes. Flossy Shipley had been wont to be much trammelled with the ways in which they did everything, but Mrs. Evan Roberts was learning that, in unimportant matters at least, they had a right to be a law unto themselves. Perhaps it helped her to be aware that a large class of people were all ready to quote Mrs. Evan Roberts as authority on almost any point of taste. On the evening in question, Mr. Roberts, in dressing gown and slippers, had drawn his lounging chair to the drop light, preparatory to a half hour of reading aloud. But it transpired that there was something preparatory to that, or at least that must take the precedence. Certain business telegrams followed him home, which required the writing of two or three business letters. It will not take me long, he explained to his wife, and they are not complicated affairs, so I give you leave to talk right on while I dispatch them. She laughed at this hint about her fondness for talk, but presently made use of the privilege. Evan, what sort of a young man do you consider Mr. Reed? Reed? Who? Oh, my clerk? The very best sort. A most estimable fellow. One of a thousand. By the way, did you tell him how you became interested in that sister of his? Not yet. I want to get better acquainted. But, Evan, do you know where he boards? Hardly. On Third Avenue somewhere, I believe, or possibly Second. The store register should show. Do you want his address? Oh, I know where it is, but I mean what sort of a place is it? Mr. Roberts slightly elevated his shapely shoulders. It is a boarding house where many clerks board. That tells a doleful story to the initiated, I suspect. Poor fare and dismal surroundings. Still, it is eminently respectable. Where does he spend his Sabbaths? The rapidly moving pen executed nearly two lines of handsome writing before Mr. Roberts was ready to respond to this question. Why, at church principally, I fancy. He is very regular in his attendance at morning service, and the South End Mission absorbs his afternoons. I suppose he goes to church in the evening, but since we have been giving our attention to that evening mission, I have not seen him. Ah, but Evan, I mean the rest of the time those little bits of Sabbath time that are sacred to home, the twilight, for instance, or for an hour in the morning. Do you know what sort of a place he has for those times? 
nearly three more lines added to the paper, then Mr. Roberts raised his head. No, my dear, I don't. Now that you bring me face to face with the question, it seems a surprising thing to say that I should not know where a young man who has been for more than a year in our employ spends his choice bits of time, but I don't. Then I want to tell you something about it. He has a dingy, fourth-story back room, small, I fancy, from the way in which he spoke of it, and not a speck of fire over. In such weather as this, how can a young man read his Bible or even pray under such circumstances? Mr. Roberts laid down his pen and sat erect, regarding his wife with a thoughtful, faraway air. Flossy, he said at last, it is an immense question. You open a perfect mine of anxiety and doubt. I have hovered around the edges for some time, but have generally contrived to shut my eyes and refuse to look into it, because I was afraid of what I might see, and because I did not know what to do with my knowledge. I have not been the working member of the firm very long, you know, and my special field until lately has been the other side of the ocean. But I have been at home long enough to know that there are several hundred young men in our employ who are away from their homes, and knowing, as I do, the price of board in respectable houses, and knowing the salaries which the younger ones receive, it does not require a great deal of penetration to discover that they must have rather dreary homes here, to put it mildly. The fact is, Flossy, I haven't wanted to look into this thing very closely, because I do not see the remedy. Look at our house, for instance, with its three hundred clerks, we'll say, who are away from their friends. Suppose one half, or even one third of them, are miserably situated, what can I do? Are they not sufficiently well paid to have the ordinary comforts of life? Doubtful. The truth is, what you and I call the ordinary comforts of life takes a good deal of money and in the city rents are high, and the boarding-house keepers have hard struggles to make their expenditures meet their income, and they carry economy to the very verge of meanness, some of them fairly over the verge, I presume, and the result is cheap food badly cooked, because well-cooked food means high-priced help, and cold rooms and dreariness and discomfort everywhere. Now what can be done about it? Then our house is only one of hundreds, and in many of these hundreds they employ more help and give less wages than we. In fact, I know that some of our clerks are looked upon with envy by a great many young men. We never have any trouble in supplying vacancies. People swarm around us, because we have the reputation of being liberal. We are not liberal, however. Sometimes I am inclined to think we are hardly fair. Yet there is nothing I can do. I am a junior partner, with a great deal of the responsibility— and a third of the voting power, and I can't get salaries raised. I've been working at that problem at intervals for a year, and have accomplished very little. Do you wonder that I keep my eyes as closely shut as I can? His wife's face wore a thoughtful, not to say perplexed, look. She seemed to have no answer ready, and, after waiting a moment for it, Mr. Roberts bent himself again to the task of getting his business letters answered. Before he had written one more line, her face had cleared. She interrupted him. Evan, when you talk about four hundred clerks, and multiply that by hundreds of houses and more hundreds of clerks, I cannot follow you at all. It is not that I am not impressed with the number. I am. It appalls me. But I don't want to be appalled. I want to be helpful. Perhaps just now there is nothing that I can do for the hundreds, so I want to narrow my thoughts down to what, possibly, I can do. What, for instance, can be done towards getting a good young man, like Alfred Reed, into a place that will be just a little bit like home, that will give him a spot where he can study his Bible in comfort, and invite a friend with whom he wants to pray, or whom he wants to reach and help in any way? That isn't a huge problem. Can't it be solved? Her husband smiled. He is only one of thousands, he said. Yes, I know, but he is one of thousands. Since we cannot reach thousands, shall we fail to reach one? Evan, I am only one of thousands, but, but how would you argue about me? Mr. Roberts laughed again. You are one out of thousands and thousands, he said emphatically. A line more, and he signed the firm name with an unusually fine flourish. There, I've accomplished one letter. What do you want to do, Flossie? I want Mr. Reed to have a room where he can invite one of my boys occasionally, and make him comfortable, 
and do for him what we cannot with our rooms, do for him what only a young man can do for a young man. I don't clearly know what I want further than that, but I see that one thing is a stepping stone. Remember, I want all your thousands to have just as pleasant rooms, and I would like to help bring it about, but I don't just now see the way. Do you see the way to this? No, but doesn't it seem as though we ought to be able to accomplish so much? It does, certainly. What is your desire, Flossie? Do you want him to have a room in our house? She shook her head. No, that would not further my plan for those boys. I would like to have him here, and it would be a good thing for him, at least I think it would, but I can see things which he could accomplish for these young men set by himself in a different part of the city. Besides, Evan, I have other plans for our rooms, entirely different ones, and some of them I am afraid you will think are very strange. He answered the doubt with a smile that said he had no fears of her or her plans. What a little schemer it is, he said, looking down on her with fond, proud eyes. Who would have imagined that she could plot, and plot so mysteriously? I used to think she was a very open-hearted woman. End of chapter 7 Recording by Tricia G.